Talk before lunch, Valentin Cabinet. Oh, it doesn't show. <clears throat> That's a very pretty picture. Um, sorry for the technical delay. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about natural <laughs> properties, MCSPs, and connections to circuit lower bounds. So some of the stuff that uh, Rahul mentioned in his nice survey overview. And I'll touch upon similar themes, but I'll give you my take on it and also give, uh, uh, to tell you something about different results. Uh, so it's basically based on a couple of joint works with uh, Marco, Russell, Antonina, and Ilya Volkovich. So uh, basically we're going to explore some connections between MCSP, that will be the center character in our story, uh, with circuit lower bounds, learning, pseudorandomness, and a bit of proof complexity. So let me define uh, or remind you what MCSP is. You've seen it several times already, so here's the definition. You give a truth table of some function, <coughs> given explicitly, uh, size to the little n, and some parameter s, and you want to know if there's a small Boolean circuit computing your function. And again, the trivial observation is that this problem is obviously an NP. There's a certificate, namely the circuit itself. But we don't know uh, why it, if it's NP-complete, even though it probably is. So I'll talk a bit about this. So what's the connection from uh, MCSP to circuit lower bounds? Uh, I view this as kind of explicit construction question. And there are two kinds of explicit constructions that you can think about. Uh, weakly explicit and strongly explicit. So let me talk about this here. So I have an algorithm which parameterized by some function parameter s, which is given n in whatever way you want. And it tries to output a truth table of some function of n variables, which has large circuit size, bigger than this s. So think of s as something like super polynomial or even uh, exponential in n. So it's easy to construct something like that by sampling things at random. So you can get an algorithm here to be probabilistic algorithm. It's just a stupid algorithm which samples a random string and outputs it. And by Shannon's counting argument, that will work with high probability because most functions are um, hard. What is much less uh, trivial and, with, and in fact is not known is how to make this more constructive. So you want a construction of this truth table that will run in time polynomial in the size of this combinatorial object, the size of this function. And as Raul mentioned also in his talk, 
the existence of such an algorithm which computes a truth table of heart function and time polynomial in the size of the truth table is essentially the equivalent, that is equivalent, to x not being in size s. Um, simply, if you want, the language here will be defined by this truth table, so by these functions, and given input x, you just first compute the truth table of the function, then evaluate it at input x. It takes exponential time. Now, um, there's a nice notion of, so we don't, we don't like randomized uh, construction here because it's kind of trivial, not very interesting. You can still use randomized construction which look like, uh, like deterministic ones. And this is a nice framework of so-called pseudo-deterministic algorithms introduced by Gott and Goldwasser uh, a few years ago, uh, which basically means that you have an algorithm which uses randomness, but if you look at the output of the algorithm, you won't notice that because the, algor the algorithm outputs always the same thing, no matter what randomness it uses. This means that you fix some truth table, even though you use randomness, so, uh, in more classical terms, the existence of such pseudo-deterministic algorithm with the same running time as here would imply that you have a hard function computable in BPX, bounded probabilistic exponential time. So these are weakly explicit constructions. And uh, sometimes people talk about uh, lower bounds against explicit Boolean functions, and they don't talk about functions computable in exponential time, but something like in NP. In fact, it's very natural to talk about um, those in the context of strongly explicit constructions like that. So here, you can imagine that your algorithm is going to be given not parameter n, but parameter x, the position of the uh, position in the truth table, and it will compute just the value of function f at that position. So it's very similar to when, say, we want to construct, say, expander graphs. There are two notions of uh, explicitness you can use. You can either output the whole graph in time polynomial in the size of the graph, or you want to be strongly explicit, and given a vertex in the graph and another vertex in the graph, you want to tell if they're connected by edge or not. So that's exactly what's happening here in a strongly explicit definition of construction algorithm. And you can talk about this algorithm being polynomial time, which would translate that you have P not in size S, Okay, so obviously S cannot be super polynomial in this case. Or you can talk about your algorithm A to be in non deterministic polynomial time. What it means is that for X on which the function F is supposed to be one, an algorithm can guess a witness and certify the witness. And on zeros of the function F, it cannot do so. It will reject on all, on all uh, its branches. So this gives you the strongly explicit construction to kind of correspond to the notion of um, lower bounds against function in NP, and this is usually considered to be explicit lower bounds. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. So what, 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 what prevents the, the, uh, the algorithm AS from, choo uh, from choosing different functions F on different Xs? Uh, so by the definition here, the function is supposed to be fixed. Yes. So it may not be clear the way I stated it here uh, informally, but the function f is fixed, and the algorithm is supposed to reply consistently with respect to that fixed function. Okay, so when it's deterministic, then it's always the same function that the algorithm uh, talks about. It's like when you want to construct a graph, you ask about the neighborhood of this vertex in this graph, it's always about the same graph. It's not interesting to answer questions about different graphs. Same thing here. The algorithm defines a function. The algorithm defines a function. This function has to have the Identifies the function, yes. In both cases. In both cases, yes. In both cases. So you specify a function, and then you can compute it as a truth table or uh, by a random access, so to speak. OK, so why do we need, um, or how can we use that MCSP uh, algorithm if we had it? Well, it's similar to other uh, combinatorial constructions where you say, okay, you want to construct a combinatorial object with a certain property. Imagine that this property were checkable easily. Then we can just randomly guess and then check and certify that this is object is good. And this way we can get something nice with the property you want, but we're guaranteed to have this property. So the same thing here. It's a simple observation that if um, minimum circuit size problem were easily checkable, then you can just uh, guess a string, check that it's hard, and 
have zero error uh, algorithm for generating our strings, which would imply that you can uh, get rid of two-sided error in BP algorithms and make them ZPP. Uh, what is um, less uh, straightforward is that if you assume that minimum circuit size problem is in BVP, then in fact you can uh, get a pseudo-deterministic construction, and that would imply that BPX is not in P slash poly. So here you don't have control of which function you're outputting randomly, whereas here you fix a particular function. We don't know how to, and that's an interesting open question, if I assume that MCSP is in polynomial time, can you get a deter fully deterministic construction of hard truth tables? That would be super interesting. Okay, so uh, Rahul talked about uh, explicit constructions and I wanna uh, just add a couple of remarks, comments about this. Uh, so recently I was thinking like, uh, why can't we construct our functions and are there any similarities between what was going on in uh, explicit chimerical, chimerical constructions in the literature in the past? And there are some interesting objects that people want to construct, random objects. Uh, for example, error correcting codes, say linear error correcting codes over binary alphabet, and expanded graphs that I already mentioned. Okay. So they should random in the sense that if you sample something at random, then with high probability you'll get what you want. And then what you want, for linear codes you want uh, a code which has large minimum distance. Okay. I'm not gonna define those things here, so it's just some parameter of interest to the person constructing those objects. For expanded graphs you want to have high expansion. And if you look at the papers um, which proved that those parameters are actually NP-complete to check, or coin-p-complete to check in case of expansion, they said that one of the motivation is that if these parameters were easy to check, then you could, give, could have guessed an object, check it was good, and you have a nice, say, linear error correcting code, for instance. Unfortunately, those parameters were shown to be NP-complete, as people suspected. And in both of those cases, it actually took a while to show that those parameters are NP-complete, NP-hard. I think this was around like for over 20 years, and I forget, this was also a around for some time before people figured out how to prove those and be complete. You can relax in the, the demand from the algorithm and say that if we answer yes, uh, the type of and whenever it says yes, then it's true. Yeah, you don't need to necessarily you want zero yes or no. You want certification. I want certification, yeah, I want zero error. Right. But you don't need to say yes on all the yes. Yes, yes, potentially yes. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little, like a simple case. Yeah, you're right. So what, what, what is the takeaway message? For, so what's, what's my comment here? So despite the fact that checking the property is really, really hard, it's NP complete and we don't believe it's in polynomial time, we do have pretty decent constructions of uh, good objects, good codes and good expanders, okay? So the fact that the property is hard to check does not mean that it's impossible to construct an object with a given property. So that's, that's good news. And kind of the bad news, or depends how you look at it, is that, well, if you actually want to prove NP-completeness for the properties you, you care about, like minimum distance and expansion, if you look at the proofs of NP-hardness for those properties, in fact, they rely on explicit constructions of good objects. It's like similar to if you want to prove that MCSP is hard, then you kind of need to have circuit lower bounds before you can finish the proof. You need to have good constructions of hard functions before you can complete and become this proof. Okay, and that's something that Rahul mentioned in his talk as well. Yes? It's somewhat of, can you go back? Yes, I try to go It's somewhat of a defect of the property, right? We know that in both cases you can define a related property which guarantees the property you want. And for, for it, you have a certificate. Mm -hmm. But you can then say the base expansion by a second eigenvalue. Yes. <coughs> sure. Minimum no distance, I'm not sure. Uh, well, for some, some types of codes, like LDPC codes, you can get it this way. Yeah, yeah, but the point is that there are some types of codes for which we can compute the minimum distance. Yeah. Yes. And that's what you need. So it's like, there are some constructions of good objects that are already known. 
and you can use this construction to prove NP hardness, but also you'll have good constructions. Yeah, I'm just pointing out that uh, you know, the need for hard circuit size maybe is maybe replaced by something else uh, for which, yeah. I mean, you're but trying to find an analogy. Right? Which would be a natural property. Which would be a natural property, yes. Right, yeah. right. right. Yeah, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that it should not be an obstacle. Yeah, and, and you're right, like for expander graphs, the fact that you can go to eigenvalues and those are things are, are very well understood helps us to construct objects with those properties. And for minimum distance, we have polynomial-based construction, say, of codes, which we know how to analyze really well. But we don't have anything like that for MCSP. And moreover, if you look at the proofs, another point I wanted to make, if you look at the NP-hardness proofs for these problems, it was very important that you have a very good handle on the parameters in question. So it's not enough to know them approximately. It, it, you need to know them very well, like to within basically precisely in the case of minimum distance, for instance. And it's related to what Rahul was talking about. Like we have DNF, um, MCSP, and P hardness result because we really understand what DNF uh, looks like. For AC0, uh, we would need to, uh, it looks like intuitively, we would need to know the circuit complexity of function in AC0 basically to within constant factor in front size. And we don't have anything like that. Okay. So it's a challenge uh, for models where we do have a very tight lower bounds within multiple factor, try to prove NP completeness or NP hardness for MCSP for those models. So, so just this question that Avi asked over the expansion, so there's some natural proofs for expansion using the second eigenvalue, and for LD, for uh, linear reporting codes, there's also natural proofs? So. Yeah, I'm not sure if you have natural proofs for linear codes. I'm not sure. For some families of yeah, linear sure. codes. Really. For some families, yes, but not in general. Okay. So that was just an aside, which uh, took some time. Um, <laughs> uh, you know by the way, and then it takes a while. Uh, so Rahul already mentioned this results that if you look at like naive attempts to reduce SAT to MCSP, then you can show that yes, you need some kind of lower bounds. And if you weaken the requirement on your reduction, then you still have some kind of lower bounds that you need to prove. And if you weaken the reduction very a lot, then you can prove that those reductions will not work, okay? Um, but still, it leaves you quite a bit of room. First of all, maybe even this would work if you have sort of strong circuit lower bounds. And secondly, maybe you can relax the reduction to be probabilistic polynomial time and Turing, and then maybe everything will, work through, will go through. Again, since uh, I, Raul already talked about that. Let me repeat this. What, what is a natural property? It's basically a version of MCSP, which can be thought of as an average case version of MCSP. And more precisely, you're given a truth table, and you have parameter s, and you want to say easy when the circuit complexity of the function is less than s. And if it's bigger, then you're not required to say no. But for at least half of the hard functions, you better say no. Okay, so it's like a one-sided average case problem. You always correct on the easy ones, and on hard ones you correct on average most of the time. And that's basically equivalent to the definition of a natural property. But as I whole mentioned, it's probably better to think about natural property in these terms as an average case problem. And um, it's nice, it's an interesting question to ask, and we can say something about that, whether having a good algorithm for the average case MCSP allows you to get a good algorithm for the worst case MCSP, maybe some version of worst case MCSP. And indeed, it's possible. And it follows from this uh, work on learning uh, from natural properties that Rahul mentioned, uh, joined with uh, Marco Russell and Antonina. And it was also observed by Shuichi in his uh, paper of this year that if you have an algorithm for an average case MCSP, then you can solve certain gap version of MCSP in the worst case. And let me just say what the gap version is. So it's parameterized by easy and hard. And you require to say yes, easy on functions which are actually easy, less than this threshold. And you're supposed to say hard if the functions are hard 
bigger than that th threshold. Okay. So you separate easy from hard, and you don't care what happens in between. So it's a promise problem, but you need to be worst case correct on easy and hard ones. Does that make sense? So, um, so this direction is the interesting one. It says that from average case, you can get to worst case. The opposite direction is kind of straightforward if you modify the parameters. Obviously, if you can solve the worst case, you can solve the average case problem. So this gives you some kind of interesting equivalence between average case and worst case problems, variance of MCSP. And Sri Chi, in his paper, has much more on this to say about connections to Russell's five worlds and stuff like that. So just very briefly, um, um, let me say how the MCSP is helpful to get um, non-trivial algorithms. Um, basic observation, so it goes, uh, let, let me define a certain notion, which is a very interesting notion. Uh, so you have a pseudorandom function generator or a candidate pseudorandom function generator. What it is is that it's some function which maps a seed, a random seed, uh, to a long string. And I think of this long string as a truth table of a function. So it's a function generator, it outputs a function. And we call such a function generator <coughs> local for some parameter s if the complexity, the circuit complexity of this output is less than s. Okay. In other words, whatever the, uh, the generator spits out for every fixed z has small circuit complexity, less than s. Now, if that's the case, then if you have an algorithm which decides whether functions are easy and hard versus hard, then obviously you can figure out if the string that comes at you has small circuit complexity or it's a random string which would have very large circuit complexity. So your MCSP algorithm will be able to distinguish between such easy functions coming from the generator and truly random strings, which means that you would be able to break the pseudorandom function generator. Okay, so if you have MCSP, the conclusion is that you can break every local function generator. Now, where do you get those local generators from? Rasbrov and Rudich in their paper considered the uh, Goldreich, Goldwasser, Mikali construction of pseudorandom function generator using cryptography. And they said, well, since this construction gives you local function generator, if MCSP or if natural property exists, then we can break this generator, which means that we can break or invert any one-way function. So that was their choice of the local generator. In the learning paper, we used a different generator, which happens to be local as well, and actually has been used before for that property in the context of proof complexity um, by a number of people. I'll, I'll hope to mention that in a minute. And you start with NW, you need some Wigdorsen generator, and think of it as a pseudorandom function generator. And also argue that it's local if it's based on an easy function rather than a hard function, which is the context where it's usually used. And then if your MCSP is easy or any financial property exists, then you can break this generator and you do the reconstruction and you construct a small circuit for the function upon which the generator was used. So the framework is exactly the same. Use locality and the fact that MCSP distinguishes local from random. And you get different conclusions. Okay, so Rahul said that MCSP and SAT are kind of like jewels of each other. One is like white box complexity. You're given a circuit and you want to know if the truth table computed by the circuit is all zero or not. So it's like a white box, you're given a circuit. MCSP is like a black box, you're given the whole truth table and you want to know if there's a small circuit for it. So it's quite surprising that there should be any connection between the two. Um, given on white versus black box distinction that I just mentioned, intuitive distinction. And we have the result which says that, well, if you can remove this distinction, then the two are actually equivalent. And remove this distinction, you just assume the existence of so-called indistinguishability of obfuscators. And the definition is given here. Roughly speaking, it's a randomized procedure that preserves the functionality of a circuit and make sure that two circuits which are equivalent induce indistinguishable distribution 
under this transformation. Okay, so if you compute the same thing, then you can uh, create distributions which are computationally indistinguishable. Now intuitively, that takes a circuit and obfuscates it. So it kind of blurs the distinction between white box and black box. And so with that in mind, it shouldn't, shouldn't be very surprising that if you have this kind of thing, then the white box and black box complexity suddenly become related. Okay, I will not give the proof of this. It's not very difficult. It will be interesting to show something like this without this assumption. And I will mention that in my open problems later. So I'm almost done. Um, so most known proofs of lower bounds for weak circuit models are constructive. And that was uh, observed by Rasborough in his paper from 1995, where he used the framework of bounded arithmetic to show that you can formalize all of these proofs, including Hostad switching lemma for AC0, uh, for parity, in relatively weak model of so-called polynomial time reasoning, uh, V11, second order theory. Not very important. Just intuitively it corresponds to some kind of polynomial time reasoning. What is interesting about this is that this proof system or this the kind of uniform proof system, bounded arithmetic is like uniform uh, version of your normal proof system, proof, proof complexity um, systems. What is interesting about this, if you can form, formalize very simple Shannon's counting argument in something like V11, which is the same system where we lower bounds live, then you get that x to the np is not np slash poly. And the reason is Sam Bass's witnessing theorem. It's pretty straightforward. The point is that this proof system is so constructive that whenever it talks about the existence of an object, it has to be able to construct it in polynomial time. That's why it's polynomial time system of reasoning. Okay. So even argue the existence of a hard function already gives you some handle on what the hard function is. In particular, you can compute it in x to the np, which we don't know how to. Why do you, what's np, Oracle coming? What's the because the statement here is exists for all statements. So you need to go to actually v12, and then the witnessing theorem is not polynomial time, but polynomial with uh, np oracle. So what is this witnessing theorem? So witnessing theorem says that if you have a statement which says there exists some object, and there's some nice formula certifying this object is good, and if you can prove in your proof system the existential statement like that, then from the proof you can extract a polynomial time computation, polynomial time tree machine, which will build such an object. So it will like <coughs> wrestle, yes. And the MP oracle is because the statement itself involves the existence of a circuit? That's right. The statement itself it says that there is a function such that for all small circuits, there's an input where they differ. So it exists for all statements. If it, there was no for all there, then you'll get polynomial time here. So in particular, if MCSP were in polynomial time, and moreover, can be formalized in V11, then you get X not in P slash poly from this. And, I mean, this is a system APC, which does probabilistic reasoning. So I wonder whether that would be, I mean, we already know MAX at low bounds. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so we, we had a discussion with Sam about this. So yeah, you can use, you can ask where can I prove this statement and go to that theory and see, see what your witnessing theorem would give you. And unfortunately, it doesn't give you anything that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you need to do something non-trivial. So, uh, yes. Does this part also have a comment that this theory cannot prove other things, they cannot prove interesting things? Uh, I remember that there's some... Um, so yeah, so let me, let me get to the next slide. Uh, so how is it related to uh, proof complexity and hard tautologies for extended frege? And the, the, uh, I think this is programmed uh, by most of Rasborov, and I think Jan Krajcik is also very much interested in this, of coming up with tautologies that would require super polynomial proof size for a very strong proof system like extended Frege. Okay, most people uh, I think are want to some kind of natural properties, so natural tautologies. Rasborov says, let's do this. Okay, so the tautology says that. Um, 
So you have a truth tables of function fn and some parameter s. Think of s as like exponential. And it, the formula says that the function does not have a small circuit. So the formula has variables which kind of encode the circuit. And it says that for all circuits of small size, the circuit is wrong. It, 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 disagree, it disagrees with my truth table in some position. Okay? So this formula is of size polynomial in 2 to the n. And the question is whether you can prove in extended Frege uh, such a tautology in size polynomial in the size of the formula. Uh, I think Rasborov conjectures that that's not the case, or at least he thinks that that's a very interesting question to explore, and he makes some progress toward that goal. And the best re current result in this direction is his result from 2015, where he shows that if you go to RAS epsilon log n, so some RAS uh, version of resolution where instead of usual disjunction, you have disjunctions of n's, of small bottom fan n, then uh, such a, a proof system cannot prove the statologies in size less than exponential. This implies that such a proof system cannot prove that sat is not in p slash poly. So proof that sat is not in p slash poly, if it's true, cannot be formalized in this proof system. Another interesting thing, I'm almost done, is that this approach to prove lower bounds for such tautologies also goes via pseudorandom generators, where you adapt the pseudorandom generators to talk about generators secure against proof systems. And this goes back to uh, work by Alek Novich, Ben Sasson, Rasborov, and Avi, and also Krychek from like 2004. It's interesting because it's, uh, you only want to show that SAT is not in P slash poly is unprovable, but in fact, for every F, you show that. Exactly, exactly. This is for any F whatsoever. So if Fn is easy, then of course you can prove it's hard. But if Fn is any hard function, your proof will probably require super polynomial size. At least that's the conjecture. It's interesting because aren't these the same examples that you talked about? Uh, so. The result by Jan and others that shows that if there's AC0, Lower bounds of n squared for the same thing, then you get further bounds. Yeah. The so res log n isn't so bad then. <laughs> so I talked a little bit about, just gave you like a very uh, impressionistic sort of overview of this subject, hoping that uh, what, based on what Raoul said, uh, to um, pick your curiosity even further and say that there are very interesting, unexpected sometimes connections uh, with the center character being MCSP. And there will be probably more connections discovered, hopefully, during this semester at Simons. I uh, just want to highlight two uh, open problems. One, uh, the one that Rahul also highlighted, and Eric Allender yesterday as well. Can you prove circuit lower bounds against MCSP for AC0 with mod 2 gates? It seems like this should be within our reach. And the other one is kind of related to trying to prove NP-hardness for MCSP, but I state this thing in a different form. I say, suppose MCSP is easy and you have an algorithm for it. Can you use possibly this algorithm to solve SAT? Okay, so it's different from reducing SAT to MCSP. Yes? So it may be an easier task. And the result that uses indistinguishability for skaters that I mentioned is kind of of that form. It's not a reduction from MCSP to SAT, or from SAT to MCSP. It's assuming that MCSP is easy to get an algorithm for SAT. It's a Turing reduction. It's no, not a Turing reduction. No. no. It's like in circuit complex uh, in complexity, well, if yeah, you assume that SAT is easy, area. if SAT is easy, then polynomial time hierarchy collapses. Yeah. So that's of that flavor. You need to have an algorithm for SAT to collapse the polynomial time hierarchy. You need to have an algorithm from MCSP to get an algorithm for SAT. So in some sense, you would be applying the algorithm for MCSP to a circuit coding the algorithm for MCSP. Exactly, exactly. That's the idea. I don't know how to do it, but yeah, something like that. Thank you. I know many of you are hungry. Um, anybody who wants to ask questions? <laughs> so. He's not hungry, obviously.
So the, could you just bring the previous slide up? So, uh, yeah, so the, the question about MCSP and SAC being equivalent with respect to membership in DDP. Okay, well, I mean, like, yeah, so, I mean, easier version of it, which is already very interesting, is where you have a problem where your two tables are completely specified, right? Mm -hmm. So, where there's some stars and I mean, there's some inputs right. and values. And there, it might be easier to show that that problem is a DP implies SAT and DP, and that's connected to learning because that's essentially showing that that problem is. Um, the learning problem is hard, Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so you, you allow to reduce this statement to anything that you can actually prove. <laughs> <laughs> and while well, keeping it non trivial, yes. Yes. Yeah. Then let's thank Valentin. Thank you.